Welcome to the All That Chaz Stress Relief Podcast. I don't like this weather. I don't care for snow. Take me to the tropics, wherever palm trees grow. I don't like this winter. This season's getting old. Take me on a getaway, cause I can't take this cold. What are we doing here? Mm-hmm. What are we doing here? Hey everybody, Robert Chute here, recording on St. Patty's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. Uh, so everywhere I look outside, it is cold. It's Canada. Everywhere I look outside my window, Canada is everywhere. We had some Arctic air pushed down the other day. It's uh, a little cold, and when it's cold, you don't want to go to the gym. Now, one caveat... You don't need to go to the gym to work out. However, that's not exactly what we're talking about today. Uh, There's lots of other options. We'll talk about that another day. Today, I want to talk about three quick topics. And uh, you may want to take notes or uh, you can see a summary of some of the major points in the show notes on the author page at allthatchaz.com. The show page is allthatchaz.com, chaz with two Zs, two Zs if you're nasty. So if you want to check that out, you can also order books there. You can order the book Do the Thing, for instance. Do the Thing is about stress management, time management, pain management, and energy management. And there are, there are my other books there, there as well, the fiction, um, sci-fi, and all that. But today... I want to talk about three quick topics, and let's get right down to it because your time is valuable and time is short. So let's talk about going to the gym. Uh, But first, what I promised last week, the wild diet update. Last time I talked about my uh, weight loss, uh, it was uh, when I was recording my last show, I didn't have the latest uh, weight loss information because I just... I do my uh, weigh-in on Sundays, and I lost another 3.4 pounds last week. So uh, that brings the total for the month to 10.4 pounds down. And I talked about my blood pressure getting better. I can also feel my body composition changing, and I'm feeling much, much better. I uh, I won't belabor that uh, this week because we have so much other stuff to cover. I will say that if you're interested in The Wild Diet, then uh, buy the book by Abel James. That's A-B-E-L, James. And I uh, definitely recommend The Wild Diet to everyone, and I'll talk about that more in future shows. For the rest of today's podcast, I want to talk about getting to the gym and what to do when you get there. Now, if you can't get to the gym, and even if you can, actually, the minimum we should be trying to aim for is 10,000 steps a day. Interestingly, a lot of people don't know that there is a theory that after 10,000 steps, the law of diminishing returns kicks in. And so for most of us, because we lead such a sedentary lifestyle in the West in particular, 10,000 steps is a good thing to, to aim for. That's kind of the minimum. But we also need to sweat to make real changes. If you want to get leaner, get stronger, more functional, functionality is what it's really all about. You know, uh, a lot of exercise is sold to us as getting washboard abs. And that's much sexier than selling people on being able to live independently longer, uh, being able to uh, transfer from getting off the couch and erect and down again uh, without grunting too much. It's uh, it's really about functional strength, what you can do with your body and living healthier longer. So the topic of exercise is so, so huge. And what I want to do is focus this podcast on two aspects of things you do at the gym. One is cardio, and the other is weight training. And it doesn't have to be a big deal, and it doesn't have to take a lot of time. When I wrote Do the Thing, uh, I should enunciate that, because it's enunciate that, it sounds like Do the Thing. (laughs) Do the Thing. When I wrote that book, I spent a lot of, uh, a big section of that on time management. And that really kicks in hard when we're talking about getting to the gym because for a lot of people, they, they, they say, I, I just don't have time. 
And if you can't get to the gym, I do want to say, yes, there's a lot of things you can do without going to the gym. But um, let's just focus on getting to the gym and what you can do when you get there to make it fast and efficient quality time. So first, here are four of the principles that I work on when I get to the gym. One is consistency is more important than enthusiasm. This applies to lots of things. So for instance, when I suggest remedial exercise to someone to fix their shoulder or you know get more range of motion in their neck, those sorts of things, with remedial exercise, it is much less demanding. It's simple stretches, simple strengthening exercises, usually done to cues. So I suggest, you know, they do uh, a maneuver called a dime pinch uh, every time they look at the time uh, quite often, or I'll suggest doing a shoulder shrug every time you go through a doorway. Those cues are reinforced throughout your day, and you get a lot of that in with remedial exercise. With When you go to the gym, you want it to be fast and effective and intense. So as if you get to the gym consistent, consistently, you will get change. You don't have to be enthusiastic about it. Uh, in fact, you're going to be less bored if you just get in and out quick. So the other principle, is, the next principle is quality rather than quantity. When I was working out a long time ago, I, I will always remember watching these five or six guys work out in the gym together and one would do bench presses and the other the the rest of the crew would watch and one guy walked past me and he kind of bragged and said I've been here six hours and I thought and you've wasted at least five of them um, because they were just it was just a, a really slow way to get anything done um, you, they had way too much recovery time now next principle recovery you do need recovery time uh, I suggest that when you're at the gym, you don't have a lot of recovery time. You go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Uh, when, it, when I was in high school, we did uh, stations. It was interval training where you would go from one station to the next very quickly, and that's how they made track stars. Now, let's talk uh, just briefly about personal trainers and coaches. I tend to think that uh, personal trainers tend to get a little bit of a bad break uh, because the stereotype is that they are Jillian Michaels uh, hitting fat people and screaming at them and counting to four uh, or possibly counting to ten and uh, a good personal trainer is much more than a screamer. They can familiarize you with equipment that you don't know. They can help you develop an individual program. They can coach you along the way provide uh, an, as a, they can work as an accountability partner there are many ways that a personal trainer can help. Certainly, before you start a new exercise program, as I always say, you want to get an okay from your doctor to make sure that you're up to making major changes fast. I mean, you, you, knew, you do need to um, stay in touch with your, your doctor and make sure that you are up to the challenge. But having somebody beside you in the gym is that extra layer of protection and guidance because you know we nobody should try to walk this path alone especially if you don't know the way so having a guide along the way is a great way to go so your recovery time is going to vary based on several um, factors your age your weight your how hard you worked out last time uh, Really what you need to do is find your optimal recovery time, um, usually by tracking how you feel, how well you do between sessions. Maybe you need more, more time between sessions. So for instance, with regard to cardio, I had a client who uh, was an elderly runner. Uh, he's he'd been running since like 1965. He's still around, still, still a, a master runner. And he found that his speed was coming down. And I said, well, how many times do you work out a, in a week? And he said, well, I run five times a week. And what he found was once he cut down his running to three times a week, his speed increased again. And he just needed more recovery time from each workout. And then 
he felt that he felt that he was much more competitive and felt better so you you're going to have to to work with uh, what you can do and track your progress that's why all those apps that track progress track speed um, uh, having a a gym journal for what you can what you can uh, lift all those things can be helpful in helping you gauge your progress so tracking software can be very helpful um, but your tracking software can be as something as simple as a, a notebook from the dollar store so that's about recovery and finally reward so going to the gym is its own reward and you will feel better having done it but you may not feel that in the moment so we'll talk a bit more about rewards at the end uh, but remember consistency quality recovery and reward are things that will help you in the gym and help get you to the gym because it's when you focus on quality time in the gym you are speeding up your your uh, investment you aren't lazing around at the gym this is something you can get in and get out if you spend more than an hour at the gym you're probably wasting your time because you can work out long you can work out hard but you can't do both so last week I talked about high intensity interval training and uh, we talked a little bit about the one minute war uh, workout with the one minute workout that is something that we want to adapt to our own devices our, our, our own bodies uh, I am not particularly sold on the one minute workout if you are not at um, your optimum health fitness and strength I think that you will probably need more time than uh, high intensity interval training um, will it would allow you need to budget a little bit more time if you aren't at optimal strength and fitness if you are at optimal health strength and fitness you can maintain that level with very short bursts of high intensity exercise if you are at uh, a level that is a little less fit than that then you're probably going to need to invest a little bit more time however that said I'm not pulling back on being fast and efficient with a workout I can only tell you how I adapt high intensity interval training to my cardio workout so before when I went to the gym I would put on a podcast listen to an audiobook and I I would have to have some distraction as I got on the uh, treadmill or the elliptical and ran for an hour I kind of felt like I had to be there for an hour now my approach is different and I'm not saying you should do this I'm saying with high intensity interval training and the principles of the one minute workout you might be able to get a much more intense experience that actually makes changes because the ultimate goal is to increase your mitochondria sweat uh, when you uh, as you'll recall from our discussion last week of the one minute workout and if you don't know what I'm talking about check out last last week's uh, podcast there is a link in the show notes for last week's podcast that uh, will take you to a CBC article and, and podcast that goes much deeper into the science of high intensity interval training uh, but I'll just tell you what I do to keep this fast and efficient right now and that is this I get on the elliptical because I've had knee problems I need to uh, I need to work on an elliptical I can increase the resistance with uh, increasing increasing the resistance itself or you can um, increase the incline uh, but I do a one minute warm-up to start so I get some sweat going and then for the first five minutes I go 30 seconds hard and then 30 seconds I back off so your my um, my effort I would say is at about an eight or nine of ten for 30 seconds and then it's active recovery time so I'm still working out but the effort put in is much more moderate it's probably a five of ten uh, or a six of ten but for the first five minutes it's 30 seconds hard 30 seconds I back off after the first five minutes I feel like I am capable of putting out 
uh, less effort for the full 30 seconds because when you're going, you're going really hard. Uh, and I, I turn the resistance way up. So that's right for me. And then for the next five minutes, I go 20 seconds hard, and then I have a 40-second active recovery phase. So first five minutes, 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds I back off. Next five minutes, 20 seconds hard, 40 seconds I back off. That ends up being about 350 seconds of high-intensity exercise uh, where I'm in the going hard phase, which works out to about 5.8 minutes. I can say that I really like this way of doing it because I really feel like I'm accomplishing something. I'm challenging my body. It is not easy, but it's over quick. So rip off that Band-Aid and try high-intensity exercise if it is right for you. Um, once again, this is a good, good, uh, good opportunity to consider working with a trainer or working with a coach uh, to get some kind of feedback, but you're going to need to experiment with it. If I can't talk uh, after that uh, or during that uh, um, 30 seconds that I'm going hard, then I'm probably working too hard. So you can add in, um, you know, watching your pulse and and that sort of thing as well. But the low tech, uh, the low tech uh, uh, measurement that anybody can use is if you can't talk, then you're working too hard. And that's, that's the way I do my cardio. And I'm really feeling like I'm getting a great result from challenging my body that way. So that's for me. Take what you can from that and adapt it for you. Now let's talk about weights. Uh, I'm going to suggest six basic things to keep in mind when you are working out with weights. And this is, uh, I'll have a uh, a list of these um, points in the show notes at allthatchaz.com. So check that out. You don't have to take notes right now. Just listen and consider this. So again, consistency, quality, recovery, and reward. I consistently get into the gym three times a week. That's the, the time I've allowed to budget, and that's the kind of uh, recovery time that I need. And my first thing that I make sure I do is I lift heavy. Now, this is what's right for me because I've been lifting weights for a long time and I can move a lot of weight. Uh, how can you adapt this to you? There's a rule of thumb that I would consider. If you can't lift a weight eight times, it's probably too heavy. If you can lift it more than 12 times, 12, 12 reps, it's probably too light. So that may get you in the right ballpark for how much you're challenging yourself. Uh, next, I suggest that uh, you do not go to failure. It used to be a lot of meatheads in the gym would make sure that they really tore their muscles up. Uh, from the, the reading that I've been doing, I don't think that's necessary, actually, to make progress. You can stimulate a lot of cellular change and um, increase your mitochondria and sweat uh, by lifting heavy and not uh, not having uh, a lot of recovery time between your stations of, you know, you go from one exercise to the next and you keep your heart rate up. You are working out, but you stay in control of the weight because staying in control of the weight actually takes more, more muscle than going to failure does. If you go to failure, you uh, do your maximum effort and then you can drop the weight and possibly hurt yourself. I don't suggest that. I think that if you can do the exercise and stay in control, then you're much better off. Next, recovery time. Don't allow yourself too much recovery time. Again, you want to keep your heart rate up. Uh, doing a weight training exercise can be a cardio workout if you don't give yourself too much recovery time between each lift. Next thing, do not hold your breath. A lot of people are holding their breath and you can actually hurt yourself if you uh, hold your breath. I want you to keep on breathing and get oxygen to your cells. And um, if you don't hold your breath, then you know that you're 
still working in a, at a, a level of effort that is under your control. Uh, next is kind of an odd one. Grip the weight hard. So in the 80s, when I was lifting weights to begin with, we focused a lot on isolation. It was you do a bicep curl and you would focus all your attention and all your effort on the bicep itself. And um, in the 90s, that changed. Um, I think it was kind of late 90s where it came along that uh, instead of isolation, we focused on generalization. So you, when you grip the weight really hard in your hand, you are activating many more muscles up the kinetic chain. So you're actually requiring more of your body and more muscle is working harder. And that's the point of the exercise, right? Is not to just get uh, big biceps alone. That's uh, curls are for girls. That's what they say is, you know, it's not just visual. It is full engagement so you can be more functional. If you want to be more functional, you need to engage more of your muscle. Next, and it's related to gripping the weight really hard, and that is tighten your core. So that protects your back and it engages more muscle and you will feel like you have done so much more when you tighten up your tummy as you do your lift. And it's very protective for your back as well. Uh, don't rely on uh, some kind of weightlifting belt to do all the work. You need to tighten your core when you lift. Now, the next thing is, uh, and this is actually uh, something that Abel James talks about in The Wild Diet, when you're doing the exercise, do compound exercises. So, for instance, if you start with a bar and you're holding it uh, and you're doing a deadlift, then what I do is I go from the deadlift to a bent over row and then back to a deadlift and then back to a, a bent over row. So I'm engaging more of my body with each exercise. It's very fast and efficient because if you are doing compound exercises, you are getting more joints and more of your body involved in the exercise. So rather than doing uh, just bicep curls, <laughs> a perfect example because everybody wants big biceps when they go to the bar. It's really, it's funny. I have seen a guy one time who only did biceps curl, bicep curls. And that was one weird looking guy because he had huge biceps and skinny little legs. And it, it really, he, he looked like Popeye. Um, it, it, he just was disproportionate and um, disproportion. Uh, that is not good for your body. It's not good for your functionality. If you focus just on one uh one part of your body. If you just do legs or just do arms, um, I don't think anybody just has legs, but everybody, there, there are probably a lot of guys out there who are just doing arms. And the problem with not having a comprehensive menu when you do your exercises, the, the problem with isolating instead of doing compound exercises is that it contributes to asymmetry. So you'll see some guys at the gym where, for instance, they are doing bench presses so much that their shoulders come forward. And when your shoulder comes forward, you're contributing to an asymmetry that down the lane will contribute to shoulder pain, shoulder issues, shoulder injury. So functional strength and challenging your, your whole body is actually much better as long as you are allowing proper recovery time between your uh, lift sessions. So how do I lift? is I do an explosive push with my first effort, and then I do a super slow negative. And a negative is after you do, there, there are concentric contractions and eccentric contractions. Um, look that up if you want. Let's just picture doing a bench press. And you push hard as you lift, and then you slowly bring it down as slow as you can while still uh, maintaining control, not holding your breath and gripping the bar hard. And then you do an explosive push and you slowly bring it down while you stay in control, tightening, tightening your core, gripping the bar hard, don't hold your breath. And that is how I lift because when I lift that way, 
I feel like I'm getting so much more out of the exercise. I, I, when I, when I'm done, I can feel the blood pumping through my body, through my muscle. I can feel like, wow, I really activated that muscle and muscle activation is for most of us much more important. Now, if you're a bodybuilder, if you are trying to compete to, uh, and you're going to be standing on a stage some, sometime, then you're going to take a totally different, um, attitude to going to the gym. If you are an elite athlete where you are, uh, bodybuilding or training for a major event, then yeah, you're going to need to spend a lot more time at the gym, a lot more time training. Training this way, this is for the rest of us. This is getting in, getting out, where working out is not your job or it's not your full occupation. It's just you want to be functional, you want to be strong, you want to be healthier, but it's not something that you're going to get paid for down the line, right? This is something where when you're done, you're going to be feeling great and it's not going to take up your whole day. You're going to be really efficient about the time you're at the gym. You're going to use your time well, and then you're going to get out. Because like I said, you can work out long, you can work out hard, but you can't do both. Um, I won't, uh, I'm not going to get into um, the higher level of training because for it, it, it's going to um, apply to so few of you who are listening to me right now. Um, but if you are doing that, then you're going to need a coach, you're going to need more time at the gym and you're going to take a different approach to this. Um, what I'm suggesting today are experimenting with ways to work with your workout that is solely focused on maximum results for regular people who are concerned about time management. Cause, uh, yeah, that's a, I'm not going to even, not, I'm not going to even get into that, but, um, one of the things that's going to make your time efficient is minimal rest between sets. And, um, I, I did a lot of research about how I wanted to work out with weights. And what I came down to was the law of diminishing returns, uh, kicks in soon after. So it used to be that, you know, you do supersets or you do five, uh, five rounds of a particular exercise to uh, tear up as much um, uh, muscle as possible, to challenge as much muscle fiber as possible. But if you lift heavy and you use that 8 to 12 rule of uh, lifting heavy and challenging your body, then you could consider doing what I do, which is I just do that one set of everything that I'm going to do. I do the compound exercises. So I do very few exercises because everything is engaged and I lift heavy and then I'm done quick because I don't have a whole lot of rest between each exercise and I don't do the same exercise over and over and over again. I do just what I feel like the minimum I need to do to get the maximum results I'm going to get. Uh, so that's me and I'm not suggesting you do all that. I'm suggesting that you consider those things as you do your workout. So to recap quickly, high intensity interval training, more about that in the show notes from last week. Um, my principles are consistency, more important than enthusiasm, quality over quantity, manage your recovery time. So it's not too much, but you get enough. And finally, let's talk about reward. Don't reward yourself with food. I remember working out with a buddy of mine from way back in Toronto one time. And we had a, uh, we'd worked out for like five minutes and uh, lifting weights. And we were there for, we were going to be there for at least an hour. And after the first five minutes, he said, uh, well, that's, that's good. Uh, now uh, let's go get a big meal. No. <laughs> don't reward yourself with, uh, with food. Um, and, and you know, part of the changes we have to make if we're going to be healthier is not to reward ourselves with food too much. You know, I've 
talked a bit about entitlement before, where you kind of feel like if you're having a bad day, you want to eat more. And if you're having a good, good day, you want to eat more. Because, you know, one's a compensation or a solace, and the other one is a celebration. Um, here are my favorite rewards. Um, I like going to the sauna after I work out. And I have a link in the show notes at allthatjazz.com to an article on Tim For- Ferris's blog. And that goes deep into Dr. Rhonda Patrick's research into how heat uh, helps with recovery. And I suggest that you, I suggest very strongly that you check that out because it is an amazing article. Tim Ferriss, uh, you know, he's the amazing biohacker. Uh, and Dr. Rhonda Patrick is, a, I, I've heard her many times on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Uh, she is a fantastic researcher who gets into some really interesting stuff and it's really applicable and all the warnings about using the sauna are, are on that on there as well. And I actually stole the, um, I borrowed, I, uh, emulated, I copied the, uh, uh, the warnings that, uh, Tim has about, um, you know, avoiding heat stroke and those sorts of things. You, as he says, using heat, that is no joke. You want to be very careful about it. But uh, do read that article on how playing around with thermoregulation in a sane way can really help you recover from your workout and feel better. So I like going to the sun afterward. I like having a shower and a shave with tea tree oil after I work out. I, in the cold, I like firing up the wood stove. Uh, and, uh, I do have my, uh, coconut oil coffee and, um, uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of sweet food, I guess I'm, I'm a hypocrite on that. I do enjoy my coffee, but, uh, I, I just think that if you have these rituals and when you are fast and efficient in the gym, you actually have more time for those rituals where you have time to have a relaxing sh- shower or go into the sauna or, whatever else, whatever it is you do that if you start the day that way and um, in the wild diet one of the things Abel James suggests uh, besides compound exercises and many other things that are wonderful is uh, while you're in your uh, still in your fast phase from um, you had a, a feast the night before and instead of having a big meal and then going to the gym just get your workout in early so you can get the most of the benefits um, or get more benefits uh, from working out while you're empty, while you're running on empty and burn more calories and feel so much better because you're, you you don't need the energy of a big breakfast. When I was uh, a kid, we would have the hunter's breakfast. I think I might've talked about this before on Sunday mornings, we'd have the hunter's breakfast and that was a, a huge breakfast before we to start the day. Uh, and hunter gatherers didn't have huge breakfasts. They, <laughs> that was what you worked all day to get was the feast at the end of the day. You get your energy from what you ate the night before. Uh, you don't have to, you know, we've, we've been so ingrained with this idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And I think maybe it's cereal companies that, that gave us that idea. I'd like to know where that, uh, that expression came from, I suspect that it came from cereal breakfast cereal com- companies because that's really not reflected in your biology. For more on that, do read the book The Wild Diet by Abel James, as I said before. And um, I think that's about it for today. So uh, to get that kind of summary of the, th- the things I talked about today, Check out the notes at allthatchaz.com and you can see the see it in bullet points. And uh, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, I want to emphasize that I'm still on this journey. I am still working out. I am still doing all the stuff myself. I don't, I'm not telling anybody to do exactly what I do. I can only tell you, you know, I'm trying to lead by example by showing you this is what I do take what you can from what I'm doing. I, I, I think I provide some rationale for, for uh, everything that I was suggesting today. So, um, 
but but do check out the links as well. So if you want to go deeper, um, check out the show notes, and you can you can see uh, why I do some of the things I do, and you can see if it's right for you. Because really, this is an individual journey. This is something that the principles are general, but uh, the programs that you choose for yourself that's something you've got to choose for yourself. You know, with the wild diet, I, th- I think the only thing that is unfortunate about the way we think about food is we think of it in terms of diets. Uh, and I think on Abel James' podcast, that's called The, the Fat Burning Man, uh, he talks about he talks le- he uses the the word diet less i think the words that come up much, much more are uh nutritional plan or nutritional template uh and that's really where we're at is it's not a, a diet is something that you get on and you fall off and um typically and uh the success of diets are it, it's it's so grim. It really is so grim because uh, I've been on lots of diets. Everybody I know has been on lots of diets, but there are very few that you can get on and stay on. And one of the things that's helpful is to think of it as I eat this way now. And if you enjoy what you're eating, then you're going to stick with it much longer, maybe for the rest of your life. And that's certainly how I feel right now. I had a great uh, conversation with uh, a woman who sold me a uh, garden pita at uh, the pita pit. And she asked me if I was a uh, vegetarian and I didn't really want to get into the whole thing. I said, well, no, I try to eat vegetables most of the day and then I have meat at night. So I'm an unethical uh, vegan, I guess, or <laughs> unethical vegetarian. Uh, and she said, oh, I used to be a vegetarian for a couple of years. And uh, I know what you mean about not wanting to classify yourself as one thing or another because as soon as you do you know the joke about you know how do you know that your friends are in in uh, crossfit or if they've become become vegan oh don't worry they'll tell you and uh uh i i guess what i uh, when pressed uh somebody asked me about the somebody else asked me about this the way i describe it is I eat fantastic food, but I eat like a French person, which is I'm having stuff with a higher fat content and higher protein content. Um, and what I don't get into so much is I've cut out the sugar. I've, pro- I've cut out processed foods. I don't eat anything out of a box, but uh, basically I have some portion control going on. I don't eat um, all the time. So, so often we've been told about how you have to eat six meals a day or <laughs> uh, to keep the metabolism going. And the problem with, with eating breakfast, a snack, lunch, a snack, dinner, and then a snack is that you're probably getting way too many calories. You know, the idea was your metabolism is always firing. And what Abel says in the wild diet, which I agree with is Everything needs recovery time. Everything needs rest. And that includes your digestive system. Give it a rest. So there was an interesting um, interview with between Neil deGrasse Tyson and um, Terry Crews, the actor and former NFL player. And he's almost 50 now, looks fantastic, incredible athlete. And his, uh, he has a limited feeding window. He doesn't eat until two in the afternoon and then he's done at 10 and that's basically what I'm doing. I do have uh, a light meal here and there earlier in the day, but mostly I'm drinking coffee earlier in the day, and then I don't usually eat until um, 12, 1, or 2. And then I don't... Uh, I, I, I try to shut it shut down all all eating, all feeding, until uh, at about 8, 8 p.m. So that uh, that does give you more digestion time and uh as long as i have my coconut coffee i don't feel like i'm deprived at all anyway that was a little bonus i didn't uh, intend to go on quite that long about uh, uh dieting but i kind of wanted to get that little review in of 
how all that uh, the the you, you can't you really can't do it all just with exercise. You can't eat your way uh, or exercise your way out of a bad diet. If your diet is full of uh, sugar and simple carbs instead of complex carbs, uh, if you're not eating uh, enough vegetables, then you know the exercise just isn't going to help you all that much. So I'm done for the day. I, uh, I, this has been a really intense, uh, podcast as far as trying to get through these bullet points. Uh, I, I hope that you found it helpful. I went on a little bit longer than I expected to actually. Um, that's not very, that wasn't very time efficient, but, uh, <laughs> but Hey, show, show notes at all that Uh, if you are interested in supporting this podcast, do go to my, uh, page at all that And on that page, you will find a button that says become a patron. And uh, thanks to R.F. Casey for his patronage of this podcast. He started the ball rolling. And uh, this podcast is also financed by Do The Thing. So if you're not a Patreon or patron sort of person, you can tell somebody about the podcast and possibly buy the book Do The Thing. Because in Do The Thing, I cover a lot of stuff that um, I don't cover on the podcast. Initially, when I started this podcast, I thought that I would be reading from Do The Thing. And I think it's much more dynamic and helpful if it's complimentary to do the thing. So I don't cover the same topics that are in the book. Um, but uh, if you are interested in time management, pain management, energy management, uh, or stress management, then pick up Do the Thing by Robert Chute. And I am Robert Chaz Chute. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. And I will see you in seven days. Have a great and healthy week, and thanks for listening. If you can still stand the sound of my voice, stay tuned for the bloopers. <laughs> and when it's not good, we don't want to go to the gym. And yes, you can work out without going to the gym, but that's not we're going to get, not we're going to.